Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Marty Glenn, along with Lisa Schweitzer. I'm co-chair of the program committee. And we're here for day two of the conference. Uh, first, I want to extend to Sherry and Brandy congratulations on a wonderful conference so far. Um, I think that for those who are here in person, uh, it's a little bit like herding cats, Sherry. People are so happy to see each other after a very long uh, uh, absence that it's hard to get people back in the room. So our programs today, we're starting with a panel on the report of the Thought Leadership Project, looking back and looking forward. This has been a very important project of the III. Uh, there's so much going on around the world in the insolvency area, uh, in part caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, but just because of everything else that's been going on as well. So for our panel this morning, John Martin, uh, about whom there'll be said, more said later, uh, is our moderator. John is a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright in Sydney, Australia. He's one of Australia's leading insolvency and restructuring law experts. He's based in Sydney with a particular specialty in cross-border insolvency. Uh, John's cross-border experience has included assisting clients with issues in England, the United States, Fiji, Bermuda, Cambodia, Cayman Islands, Brunei, Myanmar, and Norfolk Islands. Uh, to get the full bio of John, you can look on the website for the program. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to John in just a minute. I'll make some announcements generally uh, before we start with the panel. John will introduce the other panelists, uh, one of whom is here in the room with us, Don Bernstein, others appearing virtually. So we do want to welcome our attendees and have a special announcement for the virtual attendees. There will be a CLE code in the chat and Q&A boxes, and you'll need to join the chats in order to see the CLE codes. You'll need to please write down the codes and keep them for the online reporting form that will be sent to you tomorrow. Uh, remember, there's a separate link for each panel that you join. The materials for the programs are all on the app for those who are appearing here, who are here in person, and on the conference website if you're virtual. If time allows, uh, virtual attendees are welcome to ask questions uh, through the chat function, and we'll read it to the panelists. In person attendees, please use the mics uh, that are in the, in the room. I'll make a couple other announcements a little bit later as we go on about uh, what to expect this afternoon. Tomorrow, of course, is the next gen program. <clears throat> but at this point, let me turn the program over to John Martin. John? Uh, thanks, uh, Judge Glenn. Um, and can I firstly say uh, congratulations to you, your, your co chairs, and indeed the whole of the conference committees and, and, and program committee on organizing you know, what is you know, already a fabulous conference put together in very difficult circumstances. So, so congratulations, it's just fantastic. Now, it was, I think 16 months ago at the last annual members meeting that uh, all of us had the privilege of listening to Richard Gitlin make a presentation uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, and um, Richard presented the perspective that non, what, what, what one might call non-traditional public sector restructuring solutions needed to be ex explored for inclusion into the toolkit of responses to the pandemic. Now, following that presentation, a small working group within III was set up to explore those ideas. And that uh, committee consisted of, of Richard, of course, uh, Don Bernstein, uh, Shinabe, Tom Felsberg, Lou Kruger, uh, Patrick Potter, and uh, George uh, Kalakos. And indeed, several presentations were made to various parties and organizations, including instrumentalities of the US government and Brazilian monetary authorities. 
And in those presentations, we identified and, and explored a number of available alternative responses, both state administered responses and private sector funded options. Now, the issues that we canvassed in those presentations are just as relevant today as they were when Richard presented some 16 months ago. Um, and indeed, um, as we will very shortly see as part of the first presentation, there is now a lot of data, a lot of experience that um, sheds a lot more light on, on the nature, the severity, the available responses to this pandemic induced distress. The presentations that I will very, very shortly introduce um, are based on the premise that a country's insolvency laws do not fully or adequately address the financial distress consequences of the pandemic. And some countries' insolvency laws may simply not be fit for purpose, and I guess the SME sector often provides a good example here. But even with countries whose bankruptcy laws do conform with what one might loosely call international best practice, do those laws adequately provide solutions that are effective here in this quite unique context? And indeed, are those legislative solutions aligned to the current needs of society in the midst of this pandemic? Um, and just on that, indeed, many modern laws of winding up and director duties have been suspended for an extended period. But I guess finally, just as, a, as an introductory comment, um, are there policy questions that arise when government regulations enacted to protect society directly cause the bankruptcy of what was a vibrant and successful business? Is bankruptcy in this context simply bad luck for the business owner? Or alternatively, does society, for whose protection many businesses have paid the ultimate price, have any responsibility, particularly where the business remains absolutely viable but in serving the public good has exhausted its capital. So let me introduce our speakers. Um, we'll be led off by Antonia Menezes, who's a, who's a senior financial sector specialist with the World Bank and a III member for I think around uh, three years now, Antonia. Um, Antonia will be followed by Don Bernstein, indeed a past president of III and practice chair of Davis Polk's restructuring practice. Don will be followed by Richard Gitlin, a founding member of III, and indeed a, a true icon in the bankruptcy field. The presentation will then be concluded by Tom Felsberg of Felsberg Advogados in Sao Paulo, um, Tom being one of Brazil's finest restructuring lawyers. Now, structurally today, Antonia will provide us with her and the World Bank's perspective on the journey so far the tools that I guess have been deployed and a perspective on what the future may hold. Don will then have a more free ranging commission to provide commentary on some of the policy issues that have arisen and the challenges faced and indeed the challenges still to be faced. Um, we will then turn to potential public and private sector responses with Richard primarily looking at public sector responses and Tom walking us through his exploration in Brazil of available private sector funded responses. So with that introduction, let me hand you over to Antonio, uh, Antonia to lead off with her presentation. So Antonia, over to you, thank you. Thanks very much, John, for that excellent introduction and good morning, everyone. I hope you can see my slides. Today, I will really be sharing the data that the World Bank has collected and observed at the start of the pandemic as well as some of the early forecasts for economies emerging from it. And I hope that this will help set the context for this panel on looking back and looking forward. If we can turn to the next slide, please. And the next one. Thanks. So as a reminder, the pandemic arrived at a time when both public and private sector leverage were at historic levels. By quarter one of 2020, public debt was at an all-time high in most systemically important economies. Private domestic debt in emerging markets and developing economies in turn stood at 118% of GDP at the end of 2019, 
which was nearly double the 2009 levels. And as we know, the rapid spread of the virus led to widespread containment measures and lockdowns. In quarter two of 2020, OECD GDP fell by almost 10%. And while not as sharp, the drop in GDP of the G20 countries was almost 7%. Next slide. And again, as we know, there was quickly a rapid and widespread consensus in the global insolvency community that there would be a wave of, insol of insolvency filings. And this was for good reason. We saw numerous sectors experience deep financial distress, such as aviation, tourism, and entertainment. And many firms saw a reduction in demand and severe supply chain disruptions. This is data from the World Bank Business Pulse Survey, which looked at the impact of COVID-19 on the private sector in 78 economies. The data you see here is the average change in sales uh, relative to the previous year as a percentage in the weeks following the peak of the crisis. And then on the right hand side, you can see the same thing, but showing the difference in male owned and female owned businesses. And what we saw was a disproportionate impact by size, sector and gender. So micro and small firms were much more affected than larger businesses. Tourism related activities were much harder hit and small businesses owned by women experience greater sales declines. Next slide. And we know that governments reacted swiftly. The IMF estimated that $9 trillion in fiscal support was injected globally by May 2020. The OECD estimates that as of May 2021, global fiscal support was $13.8 trillion with $7.8 trillion in additional spending and foregone revenue, and $6 trillion in equity injection, loans, and guarantees since March 2020. So this was much more than provided during the global financial crisis. A recent study of financial sector policy responses shows that all 154 of the countries reviewed introduced at least one policy intervention and 80% of them were introduced by June 1st, 2020. Next slide. This is just to highlight the global guide that was developed by Insol International and the World Bank Group. And it details the insolvency emergency measures put in place in 80, that's eight zero countries. So you just click on the country and you'll get a report for that country of the emergency measures. Next slide. To understand the interventions in the space, we created a database of measures taking the economies included in the global guide. And the measures were divided into three categories. First one was increasing barriers or measures that aimed at increasing barriers for creditor initiated insolvency filings. The second set of measures was looking at suspending the, the director's duty to file for insolvency and related liabilities. And the third category was debt repayment measures. So as you can see in the top left bar chart, almost all economies in our sample introduced emergency measures aimed at containing the effects of the pandemic on businesses and making it more difficult to force firms into insolvency. Breaking down the different categories of measures, it's apparent that suspending the director's duty to file, whether least frequently adopted measures. Only 30% of economies introduced them, and you can see that in the lower left panel. In turn, debt repayment measures, which is number three on the slide, were implemented in over 80% of the economies in our sample. And the two most frequently adopted debt repayment interventions involve some kind of mandatory contract modification measures, such as extending repayment terms or suspending interest accruals, or even suspending debt servicing obligations. Next slide. In February this year, we also conducted analysis in 15 economies with the assistance of the International Association of Insolvency Regulators. And we collected monthly data on business insolvency filings. And as you can see, the data suggests that these economies have yet to experience a sharp increase in business insolvency filings. 
Indeed, when compared to the number of business filings within each economy in September 2019, it's apparent that many countries experienced declines in the number of filings. Furthermore, when comparing the cumulative number of business insolvency filings, so from quarter two and quarter three of 2019, compared to the same quarters in 2020, all the economies in our sample, with the exception of Hong Kong, have seen a decline. Australia, Italy, Lithuania, and Singapore showed the highest decline, about 50%. And again, this was the data we collected in, in February 2021. Next slide. So looking forward, where are we? On one hand, evidence from previous crises suggests that NPL buildup takes several quarters to peak. So for instance, as you can see here, taking December 2007 as the date where the global financial crisis began, the median lag between the onset of the crisis, which you can see in, as the blue dashed line, and the peak NPL levels, which is the red dashed line, was approximately 13 quarters for OECD countries, shorter in emerging markets. Eula Hermes recently announced that their global insolvency index is likely to post a 15% year-on-year -year rebound in 2022 after two consecutive years of decline. So minus 6% in 2021 and minus 12% in 2020. Clearly, however, this will largely depend on how countries approach winding down of the pandemic measures. However, Eula Hermes forecasts that global business insolvencies are likely to remain at a low level in most countries by the end of 2021. And even in 2022, they would remain below pre-COVID-19 levels in most countries. Of course, supply chain disruptions and increasing interest rates will play into economic recovery. And that is that remains to be seen. Next slide, please. For our team, however, in the World Bank, particularly in emerging markets and developing economies where, which are still grappling with vaccine rollout, continued shutdowns, Economic recovery is projected to remain very uneven. And this was supported in this month's IMF World Economic Outlook. Global growth is projected at 6% in 2021, moderating to 4.4% in 2022. However, prospects for emerging markets and developing economies have been marked down for 2021. And this emphasizes the need to strengthen countries' insolvency regimes and critically institutional capacity for what might lie ahead. Our research on previous crises shows the importance of informal workout tools with minimal or very specific reliance on the courts. Next slide. Uh, workout frameworks often have enhanced features in crisis situations, such as being under the auspices of the central bank. And there's also been some interesting standardized workout models for micro, small and medium sized enterprises, such as the one in Korea to deal with credit card debts in 2002. Uh, in particular, though, we are seeing a focus on the four following areas of reform. So first of all, strengthening formal insolvency mechanisms. Um, and effective approaches here include defining and enforcing predictable creditor priority rules, establishing efficient processes for insolvency proceedings, and something we're focusing on a lot right now, strengthening judicial capacity. Secondly, facilitating alternative dispute resolution systems like conciliation and mediation. There are obviously a range of ADR approaches with varying degrees of court involvement, but the common thread is really trying to reduce the burden on the formal court system. And related to this, we're also seeing an uptick in pre-insolvency procedures, particularly using conciliators or mediators. We're seeing uh, increasing interest in establishing accessible procedures for micro and small insolvent enterprises. And in relation to this, the World Bank has just renewed, released new standards for MSE insolvency. And finally, something that our standards focus on is promoting debt forgiveness and discharge of natural person debtors, particularly given the rise in consumer debt. 
So I hope that has adequately set the context for this panel and I'll now hand it to the next speaker. Thank you. Well, Antonio, just before you do, just a quick question. Um, this decline in insolvency filings, which I see my country regrettably leads with, I think, 50%. Do we have an outbreak of peace between debtor and creditor? Are, are they talking to each other more than they have in the past? Are we seeing a structural change in how financial distress is dealt with by, you know, as between debtors and creditors? Um, does the, do you or the World Bank have a sort of perspective on, on, on why the numbers have declined so much? Our sense is that it's very much these short-term temporary measures that have been put in place, as well as a general culture of accommodation. So a lot of central banks have encouraged the financial sector to accommodate debtors, and that is a trend I think we're seeing globally. We also have a sense that there are a lot of informal workouts happening. Um, so not involving the courts in any way, really direct negotiations with the banks. Um, funding is currently not that expensive. And so that the, the, the idea is that there's a lot of informal activity happening to, to get a, a, an agreement in place. Uh, th thanks for that, Antonia. Um, well, well, Don, are you able now to um, present your perspectives on the, on the various topics? Uh, yes, thank you, John and Antonio. Thank you for, um, for setting the stage for this. Um, so I'm going to try to dig in a little bit into some of the numbers um, that Antonio uh, set out just to try to figure out what's really going on out there. And I'm going to speculate on some reasons for what we're seeing, and uh, it's going to be worthy of, I think, an ongoing discussion uh, within the Institute. Um, so John mentioned that the Thought Leadership Committee really got started uh, based on a paper that was published by Richard Gitlin and Jay Alex, suggesting that perhaps the pandemic required different kinds of solutions from the solutions we've seen in the past. And, and uh, you know, Richard is gonna talk about that uh, when, he, when, he, uh, when he speaks to you in a moment. Um, not only was the enormity of the pandemic's impact on economies an element of the reason why Richard and Jay felt something needed to be done, but also because this crisis is different from the usual recession. And in fact, it's different from what happened in 2008, which was an asset bubble. Um, this is true for both businesses and the general economy. Um, let's consider why it's different. Um, we know that global debt levels have reached historic heights, but the effect of the pandemic is not itself a debt crisis. It's a revenue crisis or a cash flow crisis. Um, and it's also, rather than being something that is going on in the overall economy, uh, in the sense that there is some sort of bubble or some sort of uh, a disconnect in the economy, it relates to an exogenous event. Um, it's like a hurricane. And after a hurricane, uh, you know, uh, you, you deal with that kind of problem and getting businesses to reopen very differently from an economic event. And here with the pandemic, it's not a storm that lasts for a few days. It's a storm that goes on for months or even years. So it's a very different kind of animal than we usually see with economic recessions. Um, now, the pandemic has had both has had primary, secondary, and tertiary economic effects. And I'm gonna sort of describe what I see those as being. The primary effects really were the revenue effects, particularly on certain industries like transportation, hospitality, and the restaurant industries, the ones that Antonia uh, really pointed to in her uh, discussion. Um, and of course, that leads to cash flow needs and the need to pay rent and everything else, and that can be a big problem when you have a precipitous decline. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, number of airlines did, in fact, resort to uh, bankruptcy procedures, uh, and 
they needed to because the revenues just fell off the charts. Then there are the secondary effects. And this includes a more general slowdown in demand. So you see other industries affected by the collapse in GDP that Antonio referred to. And then finally, there are a number of tertiary effects, one of which is the supply chain difficulties we've been seeing in recent months. So you have all of these things cascading together against the success of economic performance. Um, but then you have, as a countervailing force, the relief programs that governments have, in fact, put in place in a somewhat uh, disorganized way, but as you've seen from Antonio's presentation, those have been enormous programs. Um, and they've included a couple of features. Um, first of all, uh, they've included suspensions of payments, and that includes both rent and, in some countries, debt payments or interest payments, as, we, as we've just heard. They've also included massive loan programs in some countries for businesses. And some of those loan programs have, in fact, permitted the conversion of the loans into equity if the funds were used in certain ways. Uh, one example of that is in the United States. If you paid employees with the initial uh, money that you got uh, in the first of our programs, uh, you were able to eventually uh, uh, equitize those loans. Uh, obviously, loans that need to be repaid are also helpful if you're having a cash flow crisis. So you've got, you've got those things. Um, and then, you have things like suspension of director liability. Uh, in England, uh, uh, director liability for trading while insolvent was suspended for a period during the pandemic. So uh, you would have thought that uh, even though we were going to see a large number of bankruptcies, um, that once the initial wave occurred, this infusion of support and infusion of debt relief in government programs was going to mitigate the bankruptcy events that, that uh, could otherwise have occurred. Um, let's look at this in the context of SMEs for a second. Um, we've actually seen probably fewer than expected SMEs insolvencies, at least on the face of it. But on the other hand, um, we need to be reminded here that once you eliminate rent and debt service, and, you're, and if you are able to furlough your employees, which in some countries you can do, um, and then you actually stop ordering inventory, um, you have reduced your cost load substantially. And your variable costs are basically, they become almost zero. And for a lot of small businesses, there aren't that many fixed costs. So businesses can basically go on hold during a pandemic of this kind. And I, I submit to you that a lot of small businesses did exactly that. And that was especially true in countries where employees could be furloughed and then collect significant compensation through government programs to support them while they were, while they were on furlough. So, so that's, that's one feature. Now, that isn't true for all small businesses. And as Antonio suggested, there may be negotiations going on out there between businesses and their creditors that, that really are consensual resolutions or consensual extensions, and I'm sure that's going on. But the other thing that's going on, and Ed Altman alluded to this yesterday, was that companies may just be, quote, liquidating, unquote and not going through insolvency liquidations. These are companies that go out with a whimper rather than with a bang. Um, their assets are small. Their receivables are small. The landlord gets the lease back. Uh, the bank gets the few assets that there are to go around because they're probably secured. The entrepreneur walks away from the business. You see the stores on Madison Avenue that are empty right now. Um, and uh, that's it. Now, the only fly in that ointment is if the entrepreneur is a guarantor of the loans.
And what does the entrepreneur do in that case? Is he forced to sell his house? Um, does he use his savings? What happens? And that's where some of the workouts may be coming in, where you have the entrepreneur sitting down with the bank and, and saying, here's what I can pay you, and then some, some resolutions reached. But a lot of the businesses themselves may just be disappearing. For larger companies, obviously, um, the ones that have total collapse in revenue fail, some have retained earnings, some were able to furlough employees, uh, some were able to get massive loans, as we talked about, and that has sort of staved off the problem. Um, now, the World Bank recommendations to improve existing insolvency systems and also increase the amount of ADR and informal resolution processes are obviously fabulous recommendations. Um, but what about the companies that weren't over indebted at the beginning of the pandemic? Companies that wouldn't have gone into bankruptcy at all. Um, one question, a serious question, is whether uh, and how losses in those situations should be allocated. Should they be allocated to the investors from something that was a, a global problem, a problem that was an exogenous event rather than a business event, or should uh, they rightfully be covered by, by, by government programs allocated among taxpayers and the like? And that's a tough call in various economies, but it is one of the two issues that our committee was looking at. The second of the two issues was, how do you process all of these things? And with that, I think I want to ask John whether he's ready to turn this over to Richard, because it seems to me that that's precisely the question that Richard and Jay Alex were thinking about when they wrote their article. Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. I guess it's me. Um, it's so good to be back with the Triple I. I have great memories. Um, Jay and I wrote this article really to start a dialogue. Uh, we proposed start thinking about a government extraordinary restructuring agency. And we call it extraordinary because it is. So why did we write this paper in 2020 in May? Um, and, and what do we mean by an extraordinary government agency? As Antonio said, we saw that many companies were indebted beforehand, heavily indebted. And the massive money came in in stabilization without credit analysis much of which was in the form of loans. So we could see a number of entities would come out of this heavily indebted. Two, as Don said, we would have a serious revenue disruption and we actually predicted there'd be a serious supply chain crisis. We did not anticipate the magnitude of the supply chain crisis, but it was pretty apparent there would be one that would cause economic disruption of a kind that we're not used to and that we don't understand. So we said governments are going to have to, at some point, shift their thinking from stabilization to growth and the future. And if they were gonna put massive amounts of capital into the economy, they should shift their thinking to say, we must put it in, in a way that builds growth and builds our employment, not simply sustain. When do you cross that line and how do you cross that line? So we thought we should talk about a special government agency for this. And so what do we mean by that? What do you, when you talk about a special government, extraordinary restructuring agency? So we looked at what had happened in the past. And we picked two to talk about in the paper. The first was in the US when the Treasury Department set up an entity in Treasury for the purpose of fixing our auto industry. It was clear that there wasn't enough private capital that was willing to go into these troubled companies to fix the company. So the only capital was gonna be the government. But the government was smart enough to say, hey, we're putting the money in. 
we're going to want to see a proper restructuring. We want our money to go in, in an intelligent way. We want to have an opportunity to get it back. We want to make sure we're putting the company in a position to grow. The secret of that for its success, and it was successful, was they staffed it with outside restructuring professionals. And in fact, they restructured the companies, they utilized our prepackaged bankruptcy law and other laws, and it turned out to be a success. And it had a beginning and an end. The second one we looked at was Japan. And Japan's really been a leader in designing government entities to help fix a troubled time in their economy. So we looked at 2013, when the government of Japan set up two types of entities to restart their troubled economy. One was for, for large companies called the IRCJ, the Industrial Rehabilitation Corporation of Japan. And they, they set that up with a government funding. They brought in private professional restructuring people. And it was successful. But what we wanted to talk about is when people are thinking about doing something like this, what are the elements that they should think about? What are the elements that government should think about when they approach a public entity to fix the economy with their capital? First, make sure you focus on viable companies and you should be repositioning them for the future. Today, um, you can make sure this digitization as part of your solution, you should be thinking about where they have to go. If you're gonna put your capital to fix the company, Fix them to position your economy for the future. And Japan did that. Viable companies that were critical to their economy that were just stagnating as banks wouldn't restructure them, reposition them. Two, as I said, staff with professionals. Three, and I think this is the most critical when the government sets up a powerful entity for this purpose, a sunset law. You have to have a beginning and an end under the law. If you don't, it will perpetuate as a power center forever. And we've seen countries do that and fall into that trap. So beginning and end. Here it was uh, three years to put out the money and two years to get that, those instruments into the marketplace, a five-year law. Four, protection against political influence. This could be a political pop in countries if you don't protect it. In Japan, they basically said, if a politician calls one of the people in the IRCJ and they don't report it, it is a criminal offense. There was no room for political influence unless you were willing to go to jail. They took it very seriously. Fifth, and critically important, when you're trying to restructure under these circumstances, time is of the essence. In every situation, you're going to have regulatory requirements, whether they're your security, SEC, whether they're your environment or the other. The law provided for expedited regulatory approvals if the leader of the IRCJ requested. And lastly, and equally critical, the banks in Japan did not want to restructure these companies because they'd have to take a loss. And in many cases, that would have look very poorly or impaired capital. So the government would give re temporary regulatory relief in a sensible way that would facilitate the deal, not impair the bank's capital, but basically improve the bank's capital, but technically they needed some changes to do it. When the IRCJ um, finished four years early, our, our dear friend uh, who's no longer with us, uh, Takagi Sensei, uh, was the chair, and it made a $400 million profit because it was done professionally. The capital was put in in a way not only to help the company and the economy, but it was put in intelligently. So if they succeeded, the government would get its money back. The government happened to make a profit. But I think the more important lesson from Japan is how they dealt with the SMEs.
They recognize <clears throat> you can't have one major entity in Tokyo to deal with SMEs. So they set up many, many local offices and they staff them, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> they staff the local offices with local professionals, accountants, if it was a restructuring professional who was trusted in that particular area. And they would call in the companies in trouble and they would just sit with them and help develop a business plan and help them see which, which companies would work, which when some cases they needed to merge together to have viability but they would take a very practical approach to their local companies. And when they approved the plan, the government would put in funds uh, according to what the professional said was needed. And it would turned out to be equally successful, but far less visible and far less known than, than the IRC. So this is what we tried to do. We said, let's stimulate a dialogue. Let's put out some of the criteria for a government entity. And, and, and the IIII just picked up on that and took it to the next level. And the person that I think, you know, I'm really anxious to hear more from is Tom Phelpsworth. Because Tom said, hey, wait a minute. Not every government has this kind of funds. You know, maybe the US does, but we don't have those kind of monies in Brazil. We're going to need a private solution for Brazil, and Tom and others designed it. So I'm really anxious to hear from Tom. Yes, uh, over to you, Tom. Tom, Tom you're on mute. Me, Is it a little bit better now? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, sorry. No, uh, initially I, I want to thank the Triple I and and the other panelists and the Thought Leadership Group, which uh, in this panel is showing a little bit of dialogue we led led during our exchanges at this at this fantastic group. So. It's, uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to participate. And I would like to, to share with you a little bit of Brazilian experience on these matters. So if there is a systemic risk, viable companies suffer. The government choice to intervene Is, uh, is a difficult choice as, uh, as uh, Richard Gitlin just explained. It can be costly and it may be insufficient. And uh, this government intervention should lead not to putting things back where they were before the, pandemic, the, the virus struck, but uh, looking at the future economy, you know, based on the new technologies, ESG, and, and public policies, which are important in this context. Uh, in Brazil, we have, of course, two, two difficulties, which are hard to, to face uh, when we, we think about a government intervention in the economy to, to prevent uh, uh, that many, many viable businesses would go bankrupt. Uh, the first thing is fiscal balance. You know, there aren't uh, sufficient funds, you know, for a huge economy like the Brazil, Brazilian to warrant a huge governmental intervention, you know. And the second thing is that the government agents, they have very stiff controls, you know, uh, there is, there is a problem in Brazil where, where government agencies are personally responsible if they, if they uh, act in a way which, uh, which uh, could be seen as damaging the company. So they, these controls, they, they don't combine well with, uh, with restructurings where, you know, you talk about a haircut, how can a government agent approve a haircut, which 
is a loss for, for credit, uh, many times for government credit, uh, without being sued then to personally to, to, to repay these, um, these losses. So what has happened in Brazil is that uh, the role of distressed asset funds have grown because uh, there is a lot of liquidity in the market and viable businesses, they have reached out to the distressed asset funds, which in a way have provided for dip finance, equity plays, uh, asset purchases, merger and acquisitions operations, capital market operations and restructurings, uh, even at the operational level. So what we have seen is that uh, these distressed asset funds have played and are playing a role which, which is quite important to mitigate the effects of the, of the pandemic. The large Brazilian retail banks, you take a country of over 210 million people, and you actually have three large retail banks and two government controlled banks, you know, such a huge company. So they have a lot of matters to deal with, and the least interest they have is how to get involved in insolvencies when their participation may then be subject to lawsuits and uh, and liabilities which they, they don't expect. So, so the retail banks in principle, they have not shown a great interest to lead uh, these restructuring operations. So what they, what they have resorted to, and this is a growing trend, is to auction their NPLs. And by doing that, the funds actually can buy these NPLs at, a, at a quite a substantial uh, discount, and thus they they would then take up the role of uh, of uh, of leading the restructuring operations, and this has been successful because there is a lot of excess liquidity in the market, and when you talk to the funds, you know what they're really after for, for uh, after are viable projects. You know they're. There are less viable projects of the size they like to, to embark in than there is liquidity available. So this, this is the, the, the situation of the market today, you know, as we see it, you know. There have been some very substantial emergency measures which have helped uh, small companies, not so much medium-sized companies. And there has been a lot of tolerance by, by the large banks and by other creditors in terms of restructuring and renegotiations and that new law also has given uh, more emphasis to mediation and other alternative dispute resolution measures. So, so the market is maintaining. Brazil, in fact, is probably growing 4% this year, although the prospects for next year for economic reasons are not very brilliant. This scenario may change. And it may change because emergency matters now will, will subside, will, 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 be, will be terminated. And uh, even, even the tolerance, uh, the forbearance, the, the the renegotiation of loans at a certain point they come to an end and uh, and the tough choices have to be have to be made whether to liquidate a business or allow it to go on so what uh, ambassador Amar amaral a former minister of trade and development he's also a former ambassador of brazil to the un and i we, we have developed a plan to create new, a new family of distressed asset funds based on the experience we're having right now, just increasing their number and increasing, let's say the specialization, which could be specialized by regions or by sectors of economies and so on. So if, if the spate of bankruptcies does increase in the current 
organic way the country is dealing with the pandemic is not sufficient to avoid uh, the downfall of many viable economic companies of different sizes, you know, as Richard Gittin mentioned, you know, small, small companies need a certain type of treatment, medium-sized companies also, and a large company. So you need specialized funds. So this proposal, which we have been discussing with the Brazilian Development Bank and with other development banks, uh, is basically a, a possibility which may be needed in the near future if the measures which have been adopted so far do not maintain a minimum efficiency for the, for the whole economy. So the basis of, of this plan we have devised, and we even prepared the documentation of these bid invites, is based uh, basically in the Brazilian experience of having government banks enhance the creation of private funds in certain aspects of, in certain sectors of the economy, such innovation or dedicated to the, to the environment. So the idea is to create uh, a family of distressed asset funds, which would do what the existing funds are doing, but the government would, would uh, help that by underwriting 25% of the funding. And market players, based on the successful experience so far of the Brazilian and even foreign controlled distressed banks are having in Brazil, would probably underwrite the rest. This is not an easy task, you know, as we, we get into the dialogue with different authorities and different government controlled banks, uh, all the issues which Richard mentioned come to, come to play. You know. Some of the difficulties are, I think, unique for Brazil uh, because the development banks play a huge role in the economy. And these development banks uh, they, they might have conflicts, you know, by creating funds which would then try to find solution for the, for the insolvency. Also, some of the controls which are in place make dif difficulties for, for these banks to, to accept the idea of, of playing a, a more active role in, in the, the development of this, these distress asset funds. The third issue which we have come up here with the, with this uh, while planning this this plan B for the economy, I would call it like that, is is the fact that uh, these distressed asset funds have been very very profitable, incredibly so. And the government, of course, has a problem of image. It does it doesn't want to invest in funds which could be accused of of raping or 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 abusing of companies which are distressed instead of rebuilding them and uh, reconstructing them. So, so in addition to all the difficulties, you know, the, the, the fact that you don't want political influence and so on, we, we, we tried to design a project which would, would take care of these inefficiencies and these difficulties and which would allow them to be to be put in place, uh, I would say quite quite rapidly, if uh, if uh, if really the tide turns and, and you start seeing uh, a number of viable companies going down. So this this has been our experience with the pandemic and with the lessons we learned from the thought thought leadership group, how to create a, a solution which would not require. Uh, a substantial government funding, but still would multiply government funds, which would be used uh, for this effect. So, in a, in a nutshell, this this is what has been our experience and how we are trying to to use uh, to to apply the lessons we, of, the, of the thought leadership group of the, of the Triple I. Thank you very much. John, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I ask Tom a question about what he's just described? Um, so um, there are two possible functions these private funds could perform. One is um, actual just purchasing distressed assets. The other 
and working them out, of course. But the second one is putting in new money, um, uh, rescue financing. Would these funds do both? I'm sorry, uh, Don. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the funds could do one of, uh, one of two things or both. They could either buy distressed assets that are already out there, loans and the like, and then restructure around those, or they can make new money loans to distressed companies, maybe on a super priority basis. The question is, will these funds be able to do both? Because my assumption is that even if you buy up the assets, the companies are still going to have liquidity issues and will need financing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, they could buy loans, they could uh, extend dip loans, and they could even enter into equity plays by buying warrants and options, uh, try capital market solutions. So there, there's a whole array of, of remedies which we use uh, to, to restructure companies, which these funds could, could use. You know, there would be restrictions if, uh, for this new family of funds by public policies, which would be required uh, from them to, in, in, in their activities. But in general, the idea is that they would really be able to, to have a, uh, to be able to do so. Uh, in our discussions, we have seen that some, some development banks would prefer uh, specializations, you know, that they would only provide dip loans or, or they, they would stay away from equity plays. But, but the whole idea is, is that these, uh, these funds do what, what currently the distressed asset funds are doing in Brazil. We, we, we do have a few minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience uh, in, uh, in New York? See any hands Let up. me ask a question, if, if I can. So in the United States, the Small Business Administration has two primary lending facilities that it's used during the last year, the year and a half, the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and the PPP program, the Payroll Protection Program. Uh, the EIDL program, as I understand it, has extended about $200 billion in loans over the last year and a half. Uh, I'm less clear about the PPP program. I think it's over a billion dollars. In recent, in the recent month or two, there have been public reports about uh, investigations by the U.S. Attorney's offices about misuse of the funds. Uh, because of the large number of loans that were sought, uh, it was difficult for the SBA to do its due diligence. And I'm sure there's much more to come uh, over the next months and years as to potential misuse of the funds. It's clear that those programs have been a key to saving a lot of small businesses. Uh, what do you see either in the US or in co other countries that have provided financial support about uh, issues about misuse of the funds and potential blowback that comes from that. I don't know, Don, whether you have any reactions in the US. Yeah, um, well, I guess my reaction is that um, we're not perfect, especially when we put together solutions very quickly. Um, I, you know, this is not something new, actually. In the 1930s, there was something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in the United States that was put together to make loans to uh, help the economy get out of the recession, uh, the recession, the depression. Um, and um, so I think that there will obviously be mistakes made and uh, whether they were deliberate or inadvertent will be determined. But this is why I think Richard's idea of having a more formal and deliberate process with um, protections that have been thought through is a good idea. Um, uh, obviously, there's a balance between speed and efficiency. And um, uh, you know, sometimes you're going to have a somewhat inefficient process if you want speed. John, whether anybody else on the panel wants to address that. Are there any other questions that we have here in the audience? 
John, any last comments that you or the other panelists want to make? Not, not from me. I, I don't know, Antonio or um, Richard, Tom. No, I think uh, you know, these are difficulties which uh, which exist, and, and and I think these are problems which which really have to be faced and. And investigate it, I guess, if there is misuse of these points. My, my final comment really is it's, it, I think the IIII has done an amazing job by picking up this project, you know, and, and pointing together the people you have, including Antonia. You know, the, the governments are going to need this in some form. And, you know, we had the opportunity to talk to some folks with Tom in Brazil and and I, and I hope the I uh, will be utilized in other countries because we're trying to uh, accumulate the best knowledge we can. And our mission is to share it with other countries. So uh, I think uh, IIII ought to be proud of how they've taken this project up. So that's my comment. If I can just very, very quickly add to that, that if there is anyone in the audience who is interested in becoming involved, if they could let me know. Um, and also, if um, they have contacts within government or um, uh, treasury um, departments uh, who may find a presentation like this useful, they can also let us know. Um, otherwise, thank you very much uh, to our panelists and uh, good morning. I think we all owe very a debt of gratitude to the Thought Leadership Program project. This is obviously one of the major challenges faced around the world and uh, with a group of such outstanding professionals that we have, uh, I certainly appreciate all that they've done. I'm sure there's more to be done in the future. So thank you. We're gonna take a 30 minute recess. We resume at 10 o'clock for the mock trial, uh, Argentina versus